And he just created opportunities for me to be able to do those things. You know, in 2015, he would, he would come sit on, on the bench with us. You know, he's at the end of the bench. Uh, 2015, he's, he's there. 2016, he's a little farther up on the bench. This isn't happening again. And then Pablo mixed up the starting lineup, lineup that day, or for the next game. I'm not built to live separate from my wife and kids. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Eurohoops Eurohoop Pod, the official podcast of Eurohoops.net. I'm Adonis Trogilakis, as usual, and as always, I'm joined by my great colleague Cesare Milanti. Buonasera, Cesare. Calispera, Calispera. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, our guest uh, today, what a special guest we have today. If we are to describe this guy uh, with one simple phrase, then that would be one of the best shooters ever in European basketball history, period. But there's much more than that, honestly. This guy joined Real Madrid in 2011 and became a part of the team's re-emergence as a EuroLeague powerhouse. He, was, he won two EuroLeague championships with the Blancos. In 2015 and 2018, five ACB titles, several other team and individual distinctions before his retirement after playing 10 years, a whole decade with the team. In these 10 seasons, he registered 50, 40, 90 career numbers. Yes, he was a part of uh, this club. That's pretty crazy. We're talking about career numbers, but so was his shooting. JC Carroll, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, JC. Thank you. Excited to be here today. And we are excited uh, to have you here straight from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, if I'm not mistaken, where you reside right now. Yeah, we're, uh, so I'm actually a couple hours, an hour north of, of Salt Lake in a city called Logan. But, uh, but yeah, straight from uh, the other side of the world today. <laughs> the other side, because we are in Europe, of course. And you are uh, at your farm. Uh, how yeah. is it? Owning a farm and uh, being also a financial advisor on an investment yeah. field. How do you want to combine these two? Yeah, hey, it's been great. Honestly, um, we started the farm many years ago while I was still playing. Uh, we only raise high-end high end beef, high-end cattle. So that's, that's kind of something that's already in the works. And then as I did uh, decide to retire, this is the, the field that I was always going to go into. Uh, financial advisor. And honestly, I work really hard to work with uh, athletes, statistically professional athletes, professional basketball players, NFL players. They are bankrupt uh, three to five years after retirement. Uh, I hated that idea. I sat in so many locker rooms and talked with so many, so many players that um, if I could dedicate my life to giving them a pathway to not only have financial success, but financial freedom when they're finished and not be bankrupt. That's my goal. Plus it keeps me close to the game. I love when I get to sit and watch and, and, and work with uh, these, with basketball players, not only on the financial side, but look, I can talk to them about uh, how to shoot a jump shot, how <laughs> to yeah. run an offense, uh, what the best teams are to play with in Europe, what the coaches are and what systems will fit them. So there's just a whole bunch that I can offer. You should tell us all these uh, things. Uh, which are the best courses in Europe, in Europe to play for? <laughs> you know, some information. So now, for those who are not aware, you're a financial advisor at the firm uh, Three Seasons Wealth, if I'm not mistaken. It's the name uh, uh, of yep. the company. Yep, Three Seasons Wealth. And I've actually, uh, in an effort to stay connected to European basketball, I've created a partnership with a, a company in Spain called Active Compass. And uh, I'll be in I'll be in, Sp in Madrid uh, two weeks from today, 10 days from today, uh, visiting with them and visiting uh, European basketball players. And uh, visiting uh, Real Madrid. I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, yes, of yes. Course. Yeah, yeah. And so, JC, was it like always the plan uh, for you to, you know, start this new chapter after you eventually retired, like not continue working? I mean, you are working with basketball, but it's it's a different thing, you know? So yeah, it's not it like is, honest, it coaching. It's not coaching like several. Yeah, of it's your not coaching. It's not. Yeah, right. Look, honestly, um, you know, basketball players when we retire, we have a few options. Typically, so you're going to be a coach, you're going to be a scout, you're going to um, you're going to work in the front office, and all those things. I thought about. I thought they would be appealing. If I was going to live in in Madrid for the rest of my life, I probably would have gone that route. Um, I, I love Real Madrid. Real Madrid's taking great care of me. I think there would have been a spot 
somewhere in their ecosystem for me, which would have been great. But knowing that I was uh, my future life was going to be back home in in Utah, uh, I had to look for other alternatives. And and this was it. This was it. It it gives me meaning. It gives me something that I can work on. Plus, it provides a great uh, a great life if you do it right. So it's good. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I sometimes think about, hmm, what would it be like to coach a college basketball team? What would it be like to, you know, be a uh, scout for for the Utah Jazz or something like that? But ultimately, this keeps me, for the most part, at home, where I can watch my kids play basketball. I can watch my kids do dancing and cheerleading, and and it's kind of gives me uh, a little bit more of a, a dad life that I that I needed. Or maybe uh, how important you... was also that fact, uh, sorry, Cesar, I mean, uh, the stability, because uh, most basketball players, I mean, you spend 10 years in one city. And so you could uh, also have uh, your family was in good place. You weren't moving around all the time. So how important was also that part of the stability? Because if you were, for example, an assistant coach right now, maybe every two years, every every year, who knows, you could move. You would be forced to yeah. Absolutely. And I was I was one of the luckiest uh, European basketball players, especially being a, an American going overseas, that that I was able to stay for a decade at one of the greatest clubs in Europe, in one of the greatest cities in Europe. And and so we had this kind of stability built in place. But, yeah, we travel a lot. You know, I'm in Russia. Then we're in Istanbul. Then we're in the Canary Islands playing. And so there was a lot that I missed, a lot that I wasn't around for. Luckily, my kids were still small, but now they're getting older. And uh, that lifestyle of being gone every weekend for three or four days, it just started to change to where that became more important to me than uh, than continuing to play basketball. Yeah, I assume you had thousands of shooting routines, trainings, practices all throughout your career. You you sometimes miss that, like maybe you wake up and you say, "Okay, I want to shoot the basketball." I want. Is, to is your first move when you wake up this? Are you doing this? Yeah. Is this your best thing when you do it? Wake up. Is this mechanical? I don't know. Uh, maybe a muscle memory. I have to do this. Yes. Look, let me see if I can I can show you. So yeah, uh those habits I miss a lot. I love practicing. I love playing basketball. It was never anything that was hard for me. But let me see if I can unblur my background real quick. So oh, if you okay. look, there's a there's that uh, Real Madrid jersey. Oh, of course. And there's the The half court, over, but enough, and the jerseys, yeah. all the jerseys. Yeah. Man, well, over is, there is all the all the Real Madrid. But so anytime I get that itch, I just come downstairs and and <laughs> and shoot. So um, I love it. I love I love basketball. Still, uh, I keep myself in in good enough shape that that no one can beat me in a shooting competition. <laughs> Speaking of shooting, I remember that interview you gave to the Spanish newspaper El País and you said that uh, my dad didn't let me shoot the ball until I was 14 years old. So uh, I don't know how old is your oldest. She's your 15. Oldest. She's 15. Ah, so you let so, so you let her shoot the ball. Just <laughs> barely. She just she just <laughs> barely got the green light to shoot from outside. <laughs> okay, but what about your son who is not uh, 14 yet, I assume? Do you yeah. let him shoot the yeah. ball? Be honest. <laughs> no, he he's he's six years old. So okay, all he okay. gets to do, he gets to go shoot layups, jump shots, but nothing, nothing from very far away. We're working on on the shooting mechanics. mechanics all right, yeah. let's go back to to some non basketball things because uh, I was uh, really curious about it. You spent after high school, you spent two years as a missionary in Chile, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did the uh, This experience affect the young J.C. Carroll. What did you learn from this experience that in your future years you you also implemented it in various aspects of your life and even basketball? Yeah, a couple of things I learned is one, I learned that there's life outside of the United States. Sometimes as Americans, we kind of think that the whole world revolves around us and it just doesn't. There's so many good things outside. And so I, I got uh, international experience I learned uh, a different language, which Funny. was that came in handy. In, <laughs> that's fast. They came in very handy. So I learned another language, and then some other things. Man, I learned. I learned discipline. I learned rejection because you get rejected a lot, 
Um, so you just kind of get this, the, you have to build yourself up and know that you have this self-worth. Then I learned service. I mean, I learned how to think more about other people than myself, kind of lose a little bit of this ego that we all naturally have. And, and sometimes guys like me and professional basketball players, we have more of an ego than others. I learned to let go of that ego and think more of other people, uh, more than myself. Let's uh, let's now go to basketball. Finally, I mentioned your Euroleague titles before. Uh, which one felt more special? Uh, good. Let me think. So, 2015 was was very special. That one uh, because it, it came on the heels. One we hadn't won one in like 20 years at Madrid. It'd been 20 years since we'd won one. Yeah. Too long. And too long. And then in London in 2012. We played Olympiacos. Okay. We had a chance. Uh, they were a fantastic team. And we we were we were young, we were inexperienced, and we just didn't quite have that toughness and, and we lost. The next year, we were an unbelievably great team. You know, the that best whole team season, before the final for the Euro League by far. Oh man, we were we were flying, like we were just flying high, man. And uh we got to that it, we 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 lost in overtime. I mean, I think we won the semifinal by like 30 points against Barcelona. Yeah, yeah, you destroyed Barcelona in the semifinal. And it just looked like we were going to be crowned, right? And then uh we were right there, overtime loss, Tyrese Rice had an unbelievable time. So the disappointment of those two years really helped lead to 2015 that made it so special uh to finally get over that hump, win with that same group of guys that had been together. Uh, I had an, an an unbelievable like minute twenty seconds where I scored eleven straight points. That, that, uh, that... that crucial three pointers and some after offensive rebounds, if I'm not yes. mistaken, which are moral killing shots. I call them like that for the opposing team. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, Marcus Slaughter, you know, Chacho finding me, getting me the ball, Rudy Fernandez giving up a pass. I mean, that team we learned how to win, and Nocioni added some toughness for us. Felipe Reyes continued to, to put toughness and we got over that hump. So th- that's what made 2015 so special. 2017 was special for a whole nother reason. And uh, uh, 18, 2018, 2017. 18, sorry. <laughs> 2017, yeah, 2018, excuse me. It was, it was the loss at the Fenerbahce, the, uh, the semifinal. That's right. Fenerbahce. And they were, oh, they were good. They were hard. We, we fought, man. We just, we couldn't beat that team that year. They were, they were good. It's funny because our previous guest in the podcast yeah. we haven't published it yet, but uh, it will be it's it's Ekbeudo, the MVP of that final four. Man, yeah. we did not we did not have a solution for him that year. We really did. We tried. He was t- he was good, man. He was good that season. And JC, your run at at Real Madrid was almost the same as the as as Pablo Lasso. Like you mm-hmm. you, you came to the team basically. Uh, like within a few span of of months years you you both grew up uh, together in a way him to like a elite year league head coach a winning full head coach and you as an elite player what made your relationship so successful over uh, over the years yeah pablo um you know honestly i part of me does wish i would have had that last year with pablo that he was there um Just, I don't know, it's just nice bookends. We started together, we finished together. Just just something to that is a nice story. But I think yeah. one of the things that endeared me to Pablo and, and Pablo to me was uh, he kind of allowed me to be me. He, he understood what I could bring to the team as far as running off of screens, uh, creating movement and for the other defense, coming off and – And he just created opportunities for me to be able to do those things. And I love the example. He used to always tell the team, he goes, look, we will live with JC shooting some bad shots. Like he's going to shoot some bad shots because he'll come back and he'll make those tough shots. He'll make those shots when we need them. And he kind of gave all of us a little bit of that freedom. You know, he'd also say, you know, Chacho, Sergio Rodriguez, he'd say, look, I live with Chacho throwing a couple balls into the stands or turning some balls over. Because I know he's going to make five or six amazing passes that we need. So he he gave us freedom within our system to be us. You know, he was okay with – he would accept some mistakes because it, he saw the bigger picture of what the positive things that would come from that. Yeah. He was a kind of a player's coach, right? Yeah. There are, there Absolutely. Are yeah. 
Absolutely. He'd walk in, you know, we were on the court for an hour, hour, 10, hour, 15 minutes. And we just would get our work in and we'd go home. It, it just was, was that way. He'd get after we needed to, but one of the most positive coaches I've ever had, Hey, good pass, good shot, good pass, good shot. Uh, that's a good play. Hey, that's not a good play. And it just, it fit my personality. Really. We want to play up tempo. Like some of those Madrid teams, man, we were flying. We were, it was like uh, a race 2014. You said about the 2014 team, but the 2013 team was also really, really good. Not as good as the 2014 team. It was spectacular to watch. Yes. And that was it. The, the, everything people, people could ask, kept asking was, can, can you win championships as a, as the high scoring team? Can you win championships? And we finally did, right. It finally was like, yes, you can. But it was kind of a race to 100. It's like, look, we're going to score 100 points. You got to score 101 to beat us. And that was fun. That's a fun way to play. Yeah. An unpopular, perhaps, way to do things in European basketball because, you know, most European coaches will go, will go and tell you defense wins championships. That's the, the motto, the mantra that everyone follows, not the offense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, we did shift a little bit. You know, we got Eddie Tavares that kind of changed – a little bit what we had, what we could do a game changer, because yeah. he was, he was such a good defender, you know? So we, we were able to kind of have that defensive presence that ultimately led to some of the other things we were able to win and is, is helping him so much right now with, with Vincent Poirier and, and uh, Eddie. I mean, that's, that's a tough little lineup down low. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you, when you were in Gran Canaria, you were a different player than the one we saw in Real Madrid all throughout the years. Also in your first season in Real Madrid, you, you scored more than we when than what we were used to see following, you know, in, in the years that came after that. So I, I assume there was a moment in which maybe you talk with Pablo or you maybe remember a conversation with him shaping your role and, and you know making you become the type of consistent player that you were all throughout the years and made you stay with Real Madrid. What, is that the case or? Right. Uh, at Grand Canaria with Pedro Martinez, you know, forever grateful for him. He, he gave me the ball. He's like, here's the ball, go play. And so I had my, my hands on the ball all the time. Um, we, I played the most minutes of anyone in the Spanish league, those two years, I, I was like 30, 32 minutes a game. And I scored a lot of points. Uh, I led the league in scoring those two years. And then, yeah, coming to Madrid, I had to adapt that role to something else. And, and I was, I'm not the smartest guy, but I was smart enough to understand that uh, Sergi, Yui, uh, Chacho, they play the pick and roll a lot better than me. They read it better. They're able to make better plays. So that was something I, I didn't get to do anymore. But I also understood that them passing to me for a three, is a higher open, percentage yeah. shot than, <laughs> yeah. than passing to someone else for a three. So we were able to just kind of find that role together and winning became the ultimate goal. There were no individual egos uh, per se. Uh, oh, I got to get my points. You've got to get yours. It just was, what does it take to win? And in that whole mix, you had Rui Fernandez and Felipe Reyes that we, we spent 10 years together and we just learned what each of us could offer and look for those opportunities. Yeah. You talked about the 2021-2022 season that uh, you sometimes you said you sometimes wish you were there. So mm -hmm. what happened during that season? The season begins, uh, you aren't with Real Madrid, but uh, you have a contract with them, if I'm not mistaken. You are registered on the EuroLeague official website. And uh, we, we don't have a clue. Those of us who don't know much about what's going on, we are expecting Jesse Carroll to appear. Pablo Lasso says that uh, we are expecting him, but he's not there. Why didn't you join Real this season, that season? Right. <laughs> it, was, it was a really tough time. Uh, that, last, that last year I did play was a, was a really difficult season for me. Uh, personally, you know, uh, on the court, my numbers, my percentages were almost as good as they'd ever been, to be honest. I was... I was able to somehow get it together, but but personally off the court, there were a lot of uh, you know family family things going on. There were uh, life changing situations going on back home, and uh, you know that year my family was separated just geographically, 
uh, we decided to leave my my kids at school in America, and my oldest daughter came with me to Spain, and so we just we were trying to see how that would work, and I hated it to be pretty honest. Work at all. Yeah, yeah. I loved I loved the basketball. I loved the basketball. I never stopped loving the basketball. I never stopped loving Real Madrid, but um, that I just I'm not built to live separate from my wife and kids. Uh, we tried it for that year. And uh, so throughout that next summer, going to the 2020-22 season. Yep. So they were great with me. And we were in contact. It wasn't like I uh, we weren't in communication. And the thought was, hey, let's let's come back around Christmas time or after Christmas time. Let's get through it. Let's play through the Kings Cup, the EuroLeague Championship, the Spanish League Final, and, and do that. And as the date just got closer and closer, um, it just it just wasn't right. And as soon as that I made that definitive decision, I called Madrid right away. I said, "Hey, not going to come. Let's just set up something so I can come back and say thank you to everybody, all the fans, the club. Just say thank you for everything you've done for me for my ten years, um, and then and then call it a day." Was it a hard decision? Absolutely. I, I never stopped loving playing basketball. I still was able to play at that level, and, and it was hard. Yeah. That game, uh, that special moment you mentioned was the game against Basconia in the ACB playoffs, where you, essentially you officially retired that day, and uh, Real Madrid also got the opportunity to honor you. You know, I ask you because there were, there were so many rumors that you are either leaving Real Madrid, retiring from Real Madrid, I mean, there are quotes by other players. Players, I remember uh, Clement Prepelitz, for example, uh, who you played with at Real Madrid, said in uh, in 2020 that uh, he said specifically that uh, Jesse Carroll changed his mind three times whether to retire or not. So it, it seems weird to me that uh, one player speaks about another player when the other player doesn't mention something about it, at least publicly. Is yeah. it true? Did you have retirement thoughts? earlier before you took the ultimate decision? No, no. Uh, I really thought I was going to play another couple of years at Madrid, to be honest. That was, that was my, my hope. Uh, 2020 was a hard year, not just for me, but for a lot of people. Yeah. Like 2020 yeah, yeah. was, it was it, it, we talk about basketball, but for the whole world, 2020 was weird, man. And then that whole next year playing it with empty, empty stadiums and no fans and, We're getting, you know, nasal swabs every day before we walk into the gym. It just, it just was tough. And then for me personally, add on to it that uh, half, four of my family members are 6,000 miles away. It was a lot. And, uh, but no, thoughts of retiring before the decision was made? Not, not really. Yeah. And you mentioned about the the culture that was within the team and the fact that all you guys put the individual things on the side to to only focus on on winning winning whether it was acb copa del rey euroleague how much the winning mentality of real madrid i'm i'm not talking only basketball generally the club as is recognized as a winning as winners you know How much yeah. that mentality and that culture has shaped your personality going through uh, and also eventually leading to to your current job as well? Yeah, absolutely. When you're at Madrid, and it's funny, I watched uh, the David Beckham Netflix documentary. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Um, um, no. Have, anyway. Have there, out, yeah. If, anyway, it's not it's pretty... docu- if, it, if it's not a basketball documentary, we ignore it. We don't, we don't care about yeah. it. Okay, Only basketball good. is real in Europe, not, not football or soccer. Hey. But... <laughs> All right. But he kind of sums it up uh, really great. And I, I like he talked about being at I think he was at Manchester United. And he's so great. And all these other cl- clubs are are talking to him. And then then he's like, then Madrid called. He's like, and that was it. Madrid's <laughs> yeah. a place to be. And and that was just the the feeling. And and it was at Real Madrid, the season is kind of considered a failure if you don't win the last game. It's like, well, ah, you want a Super Cup? Good for you. You want a, a King's Cup? That's okay. What did you do in the EuroLeague Final? What did you do in the, the Spanish League Championship? And okay, I'm, glad, that, I'm glad you cleared that out. Sorry, because, I mean, if you win the EuroLeague title, that's it, isn't it? This isn't success. It. 
Yeah. I mean, even if you lose the ACB title, don't, don't you agree with that? If you win the yeah. Euro and not the ACB? Yeah. And look, and for me, I'm a, I'm a little more like, hey, this was good. This was good. And I used to go, and specifically like Olympiacos, I'd go and I'd look at their banners and they'd have their yearly titles. Like Olympiacos, amazing club, right? Uh, also Panathinaikos, great success. But they'd have like their the years that they were runners up in the Euro League as well. Yeah, and I, I I went to some of the the Real Madrid guys like, hey, why don't we have you know like, hey, we played in the final in in 2012, 2013. Yeah. Why are they not up there? Olympiacos has now removed those banners, the participation okay. of the and, final and, four. Okay, and yeah, they may they have. I, I'm they a have. a bit, but uh, yeah, they they removed that. Okay, because I'm looking at that. And the only thing I see up there was the last year league title, which was 20 years ago. And I'm like, hey, it would be great for guys like me that just come into the club to be like, oh, but we were there, you know, this year. We were there this year. We we're there this year. Like we were really good and really close. They're like, nah, we don't care about that stuff. If you win, <laughs> it goes up there. And that was the mentality. If it wins, you go up. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I, I, my mind got stuck a bit and I'm, I'm like, what is he talking about? And then I remember that when you played, the banners uh, were up and now they have uh, removed. Now they've removed them. So they, I guess I've been gone that long. Unfortunately, I need I need to go watch a game there and see what see what the new stuff looks like. Uh, okay, I don't I don't think that we like you very much now at Olympiacos. After I mean, they already probably disliked you a bit after those three pointers in the final in 2015. But okay, I'm just joking. Uh, speaking about um, the other EuroLeague uh, championship for 2018. Yes, I'm let's wondering, do it. I'm a... <laughs> when did you first hear the words Luka Doncic? Um, 2012 or 13, when he's about 11 years old. Okay. Uh, it's funny, I can't remember specifically in our, in our old practice facility in Valle de las Cañas, They, in the back hallway, they bring Luka Doncic in and they go, hey, JC, this is Luka. And at that time, I was kind of a cool a cool deal. Like, that's kind of a big deal to, to Luka, I think. He's like, oh, this is JC. And uh, like, they go, hey, we think he's going to be pretty good. He's like 11, 12 years old. He's going to be pretty good. So that's the first time I, I met Luka. And uh, obviously, from, from a distance, we kept watching him just – do some stuff. They're like, holy cow, holy cow, this kid's pretty good. And then next thing you know, he's practicing with us. And the next thing you know, you were there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you were there throughout the whole journey. You were there. Yeah. You made And it was effort. so fun. You know, 2015, he would he would come sit on on the bench with us. You know, he's at the end of the bench. Uh 2015, he's he's there. 2016, he's a little farther up on the bench. So 17, he started to get more minutes. And then 2018, he's yearly MVP. It, like, the progression <laughs> was just unbelievable. And I was able to see him grow. You know, we talked about 2018. We had very little expectations from the basketball world to win it. We, we, we went into the fifth. We were three seated fifth in the playoffs. True. And we had to go to Panathinaikos and play. If you remember you were without your one, MVP, you were without your MVP the whole season, Sergio Yul, last season. Yep. MVP. yep, exactly. And we go into the Panathinaikos. If you remember that game, we got down like 27 20. to three or four. Yeah. You, four were 20 points you were crossed. You were crossed. First, in the first uh, like five minutes of the game, and we end up losing by 30 something points. Um, it it looked bleak. And then that night, Pablo had us watch the entire game. We spent like four hours. The same uh, night? Pa- after that the same game? Night, after oh, the wow. game. That oh, same wow. night. It was not fun. Like, it was it was terrible. I'm sure. <laughs> but, but he's like, look at this guy. Look at this guy. He knocks you on the ground, and then he stands over you. Look at this guy. You get a stand for that? You know, look at this. Look at this. Wow. Look at him just beat you. And so look at him just beat you up. Like they're laughing at you. Like they're on the bench, you know. And it just kind of put this determination. It's like, this isn't happening again. And then Pablo mixed up the starting lineup, lineup that day or for the next game. He uh, he put Rudy Fernandez, me, Felipe, 
Luca and Trey Tompkins, I think those five. And, you know, me, Rudy and, and Felipe kind of looked at each other. We're like, <laughs> all right, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and, uh, and we came out and we were just on it, man. We were just on it. Um, uh, kicking out. I hit a couple N one threes pass out to the Felipe Felipe hits a three pointer. Rudy's doing his thing. Luca was so much better from game one to game two. And we won that game and we didn't lose another yearly game the entire season. We we then won three straight against Panthinaikos and then we won the two to, to win it. So that one was unbelievable because of where we started, you know, losing by 30 points as a fifth seed to winning the whole thing. Like very memorable. And Luca obviously had the unbelievable run in um in the yearly championship, uh, the final four, MVP. I mean, the dudes. We all seen it. The dude's magic. Yeah, yeah. Probably, probably for some, uh, maybe the one to win the MVP this season. It depends on how the Mavericks will do. It depends on a lot of uh, things. When did when was the first time to to finish the Luca chapter? Because we can spend the whole podcast talking about Luca and only Luca. Yeah. When was the first time that uh, you thought that wow, this this kid is something completely different than anything else that. Uh, This this is truly this is truly the generational talent that everyone is talking about. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of moments that come to mind. One, we were playing in Basconia, and this might not have been that 2018 year, maybe it was the 2017 year. But he he took the ball down the right side down the lane, and he kind of just wrapped it around his back. That highlight, one hand. insane. Then, yeah, what the highlight. And, And then he threw it so high off the backboard and it just went in. And I was going, geez, that is, that's different. That's different level. And I think I was the guy in the corner, um, like spotting up, like I'm over here. It's like, holy cow, that was really nice. And then, um, you know, we played Barcelona, which those are big games. Like those are another level of concentration. Those are another level of, of uh, pressure. And he had the, again, it's a highlight, it's a highlight of uh, Victor Claver you know, slipping twice on the logo, you know, he That's crosses good. him up, takes a step back, drops wow. off to Felipe for a layup. Uh, a couple moments like that, there was like, holy cow, this guy gets it. And then the, the final four against Fenerbahce um, in 2018, he just, he controlled the game. He was composed. He, he didn't get rattled. The pressure didn't get to him. Like this dude's, this dude's it. He's special. Yeah, for sure. And uh, moving on to another Real Madrid chapter, uh, we would like to open the Chus Mateo one. Uh, it's it's surely different being an assistant, regardless how many titles you can win as an assistant coach, but it's surely different being an assistant than being the head coach of a team. So were you expecting him uh, to be so successful in his first season as, as head coach to win the, the EuroLeague? That's that's a hard question and with an easy answer at the same time. I, I love Chus. I thought Chus was a great coach. Uh, he, him and I spent a lot of time after practice shooting shots, getting extra shots. He was a guy I went to when I had questions before I went to Pablo. Like he was always kind of my filter of, you know, help me understand this, talk to me. So I love Chus Mateo. But to say I thought he was going to be as successful as he has been, is no, you know, I, yeah. I felt like we did something really special that was kind of a something that it's, it's not easy to win basketball games, especially at that level. And so when he got there, I was like, he's in a no win situation. He has to win now or they're yeah. going to find somebody else. Sure. And to his credit, he did it. Like he did what he had to do. Uh, you're a league champion, uh, which I y'all. That's when I get most upset or most, most jealous. It's like, man, I wish I was there. I wish I was part of that. Um, you know, Kings Cup, they just won the Kings Cup again. Their team's unbelievable this year. There's no one in the no, rankings no. close right now. No, 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 like, no. They, they are, it would be surprising themselves. if they don't finish first in the regular season to be a soccer. Yeah. Yes. And they're yep. playing by far the best uh, basketball uh, as well in the competition right now. Yeah, they're playing great basketball. They have a great squad. I mean, the talent level that they have is is unbelievable. They've reloaded well, and they still maintain some of that uh, veteran leadership. Look, that that generation of Spanish players, the Rudy, Rudy's, Sergi's, Chachos, Felipe Reyes, 
that generation are winners, man. Like yeah. they're winners. They have on all levels, international and uh... all levels. And you add into that the Juan Carlos Navarros, the Pau Gasols, the Marcus Sauls, uh, the Bernies, and you know, all those, all those guys. That was a generation of winners. I was fortunate enough to play a lot, a lot of years with that generation of winners. And that's just continued, man. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you, you mentioned some of the the, the greatest players in, in Real Madrid basketball history, but you yourself, you retired with 709 games with Real Madrid. It's the most by a non-Spanish player in the club's history. Did you expect, I, 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 guess, I guess the answer is once again, no, but did you expect to reach such a landmark when you, when you joined the team back in 2011? Right. In, um, in my heart of hearts, I always, you know, I don't vocalize it, but it's like, I always felt like I could play at that level for a very long time, but then to actually get it with a club and a team that wins and, and get to the 10 years. Yeah. I look back at 709 games and yeah, it's, it's unbelievably um, eye opening and um, and rewarding and and a sense of pride. It's it's cool. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I love some of those guys that are there. You know, Fabiano Coser and those guys. I hope they play forever there. But I kind of don't want them to play more than seven hundred nine games. But that's a that's okay. That's something <laughs> yeah. uh, they can they if they if they do great. If not great, they've had great success and um, you know. Extremely grateful for my time there. Uh, I have one question before we proceed to to the last chapter of the podcast with some uh, quick questions and answers. If I counted right, you extended four times with Real in 2013 yeah. until 2017. And then it was early extensions before your contract actually expired. 2016 until 2019, then one 2019 until 20. 20 and you had the extension 2020 it was uh, the last one uh, and i'm wondering okay this this is the guy one of the top shooters in euroleague he can be an asset to to any team even even a team that perhaps is not as big a real madrid they can get this guy use him in another way another powerhouse could also use him in another way this guy is one of the most coveted players every every fan What is Jesse Carroll says, oh, why why don't we have a Jesse Carroll? Why don't we have this guy that can be an automatic and shoot the ball like that? Were you ever close to joining another team? Were you ever approached by other clubs? Were you had an offer that you actually considered before, in the end, you agreed to stay with Real? Yeah. <clears throat> no. Uh, when, I was at, when I was at Gran Canaria, yeah, I had a big decision. It was, it was hey, Barcelona or Madrid? Like, that, yeah. that was... That was kind of my dis my choices, and at that time, and I I speak very highly of Juan Carlos Navarro all the time. Like I I kind of admire the dude. I love the, his style of play, and uh, but as I looked at their team, I said I don't I don't know how him and I work together on the team. Uh, yeah. Looked at Madrid, I kind of saw a need for somebody that could could come off screens, that could shoot, could shoot little runners, and a young core of Spanish guys that were hungry, that were winning. And so I made that decision. And after I made that decision, we got Pablo. We started having success. And it, it just it was an easy decision for me. And like you said, I, I re-upped before my contracts were even up most of the time. Honestly, I'd, I'd come home in the summer. All the times. All the times. I'd come home in the summer. And I remember I'd be sitting out here in the dirt on my farm. You know, it's like a like 45 degrees outside Celsius and I'm sitting out there just sweating and I'm like, Hmm, I was, and I, I'd call my agent and say, Hey, ask Madrid if they want to add another year. And he would, and usually they'd get back with me within a week and go, yeah, they, they want to add another year. And, simple and as, the that. as simple as that. And the negotiation was as simple as they go, they want to offer you this. And I go, right. okay, that's, <laughs> that's it. Like I, I knew where I wanted to be. I didn't want to go anywhere else. And Madrid valued what I had. And uh, so it was, it was an easy, it was probably some of the easiest negotiations for Madrid. My agent, it was easy. Um, I never looked for greener pastures. I never chased what maybe could have been more money. Uh, I was happy where I was. I wanted to stay there for a long time and was able to do it. And you said that Real Madrid valued where you were bringing to the team, which is, I mean, 
the best shooter in the Euro League uh, when when you were playing. But we can we can also assume that you consider yourself the best shooter in the Euro League at the time at the time you were playing. I mean, most shooters feel that way. Yeah. 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 Look, confidence. Confidence is a big thing when it comes to to shooters. If you don't really have true. it, you're. It's amazing that little magic word of confidence. It can it can have you make impossible shots, and then if you don't have it, it can you can miss the simplest of shots. So yeah, yeah. I worked hard, and and look, I loved all those like coaches surveys. Who's the best shooter in the Euro League? And I think for almost ten years, my name was at the top of that list, and. Um, I tried to back it up. I was, I was never necessarily a volume shooter, but a high percentage shooter. I had a couple of years right. or a year or two that I shot over 50% from three. You know, you mentioned that. Yeah, you, you, ha- 50, you, you finished with uh, 50, 40, 19. I mean, what more could you ask? Uh, to, yeah. have, to have that on a season, it's, it's okay, it's good. To have that for, throughout 10 years in the EuroLeague, it's crazy. Uh, and I'm not saying that because we have you here. I don't know who who has that in, for for a career in the Euroleague, and taking difficult yeah. shots because so, so selection matters. Yeah. There's Gigi, there's yeah. Gigi, I think, in the list as well. There's a list. I did see Euroleague posted a little uh, post of I don't know if it was career or if it just was players. It that was, had, it had was a career, season. but I, I don't want to be critical of the Euroleague or something. But it had the players who played, for example, 160 games, and then had players like you who played for 10 years. And I don't think you can really compare. I mean. Yeah, all of these players are doing something really good, but you can't compare careers with three, four seasons. Okay, let's be awesome. Hey, I, I like that. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who was the the best shooter not named Jay Z Carroll? Good. Uh, yeah, there were a couple. You know, Burke Tans was really was really tough. Both of them. Both of them both were of them, pretty both good. Of them, very true. Yeah, they were very good. Uh, I, I mentioned Navarro. Like I, I really loved watching Navarro play. Um, uh, the the kid from Grand Canaria, the the American Marcus kid. Erickson. Uh, Erickson was great. Erickson. Uh, ah. Car- Cur- Courage was Curich. great. Kyle Courage, yeah. Look, Abrines. Abrines is, has had moments of being a really great outside shooter. Uh, who am I yesterday, missing? Oh, I'm missing this year. Yesterday, JC, uh, we. By the way, for for our viewers, we are recording on February twenty third of February. Yesterday there was Italy Turkey in the Eurobasket mm-hmm. qualifiers, and we were talking about it before the podcast with Antonis. There's the possibility of Tarek Biberovic becoming a great shooter in the Euroleague. I don't know if you remember about him, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... So, you know, there's a number of guys. There, there are a few guys like that that were kind of uh, shooters. But even with them, like Marcus Erickson, he didn't play a ton of years in the EuroLeague, uh, Courage. But uh, the thing, I kind of also had the secondary option of, of little runners in the lane that I think helped keep people and defenders honest. And, and that's where Navarro was also good. He could shoot the outside shot, but he had the, the bomba that he would shoot. And um, so I think that's something that kind of separated me from those guys that were just purely shooters. We talked shooters, but if you were put in the position to shoot, it's because somebody gave you a good a good screen. Who was your best screener? Felipe Reyes, man. Uh, <laughs> he has he has the magical uh, culo, man. That dude, <laughs> that dude. <laughs> Oh my God! That that dude said great screens. Look, I also loved uh, Gustavo Ayon. I thought he he was so much fun to play with. Uh, Eddie Tavares but, and I. But, we, it, but he didn't have the, the culo that Reyes has. <laughs> no, okay. no one has the no one has the culo that, that Reyes has. That's oh that's, uh, that's one of a that's kind. So cool, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, him. But hey, I played with great point guards. Think about it. Uh, Chacho, yearly give me P. Sergi, yearly give me P. Luka Doncic, Luka. you're like MVP. Facundo Campasso, Bingo. you're like MVP. Like, I played with four point guards that were you're like MVPs. They, they got it. Facu like, not yet, was hot. but maybe, maybe this season. Facu oh, not, not, yet. not yet. That's right. But he's in the conversation deep this season. He's, he's the conversation for sure. All right. They, well, I all right. I just put him out there. So as soon as he is, then <laughs> then the, that list of four works out. But... Yeah, the um, prophecy Chacho, will be fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, and Chacho, so Chacho broke some kind of 
um, your league assist record or or a number. Maybe it was like 2,000 assists. I remember what it exactly it was. And they listed the, the players that he had assisted to the most. And I was number one on the list. And it, it surprised me a little bit because I didn't think we played together for enough years to for me to be that guy. And I messaged him like, hey, man, this is – congrats. This is awesome. This is great. Um, I'm surprised I'm number one on the list. And I think he took it the wrong way. I was like, hey, that's awesome because we played together for such a short amount of time. He's like, he's like, what are you talking about? I always look to give you the ball. I'm like, yeah, I know. I did <laughs> Oh my. I just didn't, re- I just didn't realize – I just didn't realize that I was the number one guy on the list. Like, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. To continue with these quick questions, as we're wrapping it up, uh, did you really tell Dwayne Wade that he's the second best shooting guard after you? To those who yes. don't know, you have a picture with Dwayne Wade uh, on your Instagram, and you said that, uh, really, did you tell him? <laughs> yes, that was the first comment. I said, Dwayne, <laughs> awesome to meet you. I have to get a picture. I don't ask a lot of people for pictures. I was like, I don't know. And I said, hey, just so you know, you're probably the second best shooter in this room. <laughs> and he goes, who's the first? I was like, right here. So <laughs> he was he was a great sport about it. He goes, you're, you're probably right, but uh, I'm a I'm a gamer. That was his comment. But I'm a gamer. I go I go get games. I'm like, all right, it's fair enough. Yeah. Who is the next Jesse Carroll? Exactly. If there is a next Jesse Carroll, that's a, that's a big question. Um, uh, good. Look, you, you hate to, you like to kind of always think that you're, you're one of one, but even if you look at Madrid right now, I think Musa, Musa, is that how you say his name? Jan um, Musa. Jan and Musa, yeah. Yeah. I think he has a great game. I think he shoots well from outside. I think he's able to score baskets. Um, you know, I think some of the things that, that would lead to like the, another JC Carroll, is someone that's able to to score a lot with with limited minutes. You know, I was I never played more than than 18, 19 minutes a game and to be able to score or average 10, 12, 14 points in in 18 minutes is is tough. And so it kind of takes that kind of a player that can come in, be a high percentage guy, um not a big volume shooter and do a lot with with limited time. I, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I know that you're a Christian, and uh, I don't know if you trust talked for your career. Say that again. Did you did you trust talk? Did you did you did you were you were you a trust talker? Because I want to ask <laughs> you, because I know you are a Christian, and I know that uh, there's your faith, and maybe you you didn't want to do that. Did you? No, did you hey, trust? no, and, and, vocally. And, uh, the, yeah. Uh, continue because I wanted to ask you how did you react essentially to the trust talk because sometimes you don't want to trust talk but when there are others are trust talking you trust talking you trust talking you then you might go off you might also trust talk even though you oh, yeah. don't feel like trust talking that's where I wanted to get at all right look so so vocally I didn't talk a lot I just kind of went out and like but like inside like I was a I was a sniper man I was an assassin I was a killer like I wanted to go out and I wanted to, to kill you And so most of the time my trash talk was, look, I just went back to back to back three pointers on you. Maybe you should stop talking. Uh, so I was not a big, I was not a big trash talker, but um, I mean, I had my moments. I got, I got kicked out of a few games. But you are a nice guy. You are Mr. Nice Guy also at the same time that you, you won't, to, you won't be involved in any brawl. You wouldn't shout a lot. You wouldn't swear. You wouldn't make uh, people hate you on the court. You wouldn't be a dirty player, but. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't expecting that, <laughs> to be well, honest. Look, man, like those guys at Madrid were my brothers, but, uh, you know, we had a few, we had some moments in practice, uh, you know, ask Jonas Machulis, uh, him and I would, like, I love that guy. He's one of my best friends, but, uh, you know, he would, he would get under my skin at times and I'd have to get after him. And, um, but then immediately after practice, it'd be like 30 seconds and we were best friends again. Like, That's what I loved about basketball. That's why one of the things I loved about it was we could compete, we could we could fight, we could argue, and and then 10 minutes later, it was like it never happened. I miss that. Like I miss that. I can't do that in financial advising. I can't go fight with people. You you and, can't really. 
and then make up with them five minutes later because they, they'll hate me. But in basketball, you get to have all those ranges of emotions, and I do miss that. Sure. So 709 games, a lot of free pointers. What's the biggest free pointer of your career? Biggest three pointer was. Uh, here you go. I got a picture of it. Okay, great. <laughs> this is Someone this was made a truly interactive podcast. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, oh there it's it blurred. Is. It's blurred. Okay, it's yeah, blurred. yeah, but let me get that. Yeah, yeah. Hola. There you yeah. go. Okay. Let's yes, see. Barcelona. Yes, I guess Barcelona. Of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah right there. I realized that's who I saw the other players. Yeah. So that was uh that was the single most like um moment you know, the the year league uh final four threes against Olympiacos are super memorable, but that was like one specific three pointer that won a game that for changed those, the course. Yeah, sorry to put the co- oh okay, you're going to talk about it. Yeah, I was going to give the context, but go ahead, be be my guest. All right. So I you guys probably know us, but maybe not, but European basketball season is long. It's Very 10 long. months long. And by the time you get to this game, you know, once you get to this game, you've been there for almost 10 months. It's July. It's late July. And we had home court advantage. And if we lost this game, we lost home court advantage. We had to go win two games in Barcelona. And we were down big time. And I'm sitting on the bench going, in my head, I'm going, all right, I have to change my flights. I have to do my flights home. We have to go back to Barcelona. It's, it's another week. And then we just kind of get back and we get a chance to Sergi shooting free throws down two points. He misses the second one. And again, Rudy, man, he's a winner. He gets the rebound the that he should not have got. Gets the offensive rebound, throws it to Sergi, who's got a shot to tie it. But Sergi, again, just being the, the smart player he is, he finds me. I'm over there waving my hands. You know, <laughs> I'm waving my hands. He finds me, and I knew Claver was flying out, and I, I wanted to make sure and get a good shot off, and so I shot faked. He went by and, man, just just drained it. That I got the rebound. I ran around the court. I actually stole the basketball from that game. It's in my my cabinet over here. Um, wow. So we talk about one three pointer. That was the single most emotional three pointer I ever made. Yeah, and uh, to 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 finish uh, the context, uh, you go up to zero in the series. Barca wins one, but then you win the other one, and boom, champions again in the ACB again. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And so that was it, man. It was it was unbelievably exciting. It was. It was after we won that game, we knew it was over. Like it was just details. Like, yeah, we we got this. So, JC, to to finish this great conversation, and we thank you for that. Everyone remembers you as a as a shooter first and foremost. We 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 basically uh, made a whole chapter of this podcast talking about three pointers, shooting. You know, is there something else you'd want to be thought of? Yeah, um, a winner. Honestly, uh, I was able to to renegotiate contracts easily with Madrid because we were winning games, we we're winning championships. If we weren't, those would not have gone as well as they did. If I wasn't making shots, those wouldn't have gone as well. So, look, three pointer competitor, uh, a winner. Um, you know, I always felt like I was a, a good ambassador of basketball, or I tried to be at least. I, I tried to interact with fans. Yeah. I tried to give, you know, thoughtful interviews and, and answer questions. I rarely turned down an opportunity to talk with people. Um, so those are things I hope that I remembered for and and on the basketball court. And now I hope I can continue the uh, relationship with European basketball through um, helping these athletes be responsible with their finances and uh, be able to live long, happy, financially successful lives afterwards. Sure. Jesse, uh, I can't uh, describe how much we appreciate this conversation and you 
being with us. Uh, I know that uh, you are busy. You have uh, you have a big uh, f- f- family, and congratulations for that. I wish you the best for them. And you have uh, your business. So thank you really for finding the time to do it with us. We we really appreciate it, and thank you for being such such a great such a treat to have you talking uh, talking about uh, basketball. It was it was a pleasure for us, JC. Yes. Hey, thank you. Thanks for the invite. Anytime you want to talk basketball and, and, and stories, I'm all about it. That's that's fun stuff for me. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this. And uh, Cesare, thank you also for another you, uh, for coping with me at another Eurohoopod. To our viewers, check us out uh, on YouTube, of course, on the official channel of uh, Eurohoops. You can find also the, postca- the podcast. You can also find it on Spotify and uh, on Apple. Uh, see you next week with a guest that we can only hope it will be as interesting as Jesse Carroll was. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Take care.